Hello? Oh, wonderful. Good evening, folks. I think it's been a long day. Good evening, folks. All right, wonderful. So it's always a challenge being the last session of the day because pretty much you stand between, or rather we stand between you guys and a lovely dinner that's to follow. Uh, but we will try and make this interesting. Uh, we've, I believe we have about 45 minutes. Uh, we're going to try and keep this interesting. Uh, so to start with, uh, I'm Nahaz Mohammed. I'm from Microsoft, and uh, this is... Do you want me to say that again? Just one minute. All the way through? Yeah. Hi. Okay. No? Wonderful. Yeah. No, okay. So my name is Anand. I'm, a, I'm also from Microsoft. Yeah. So um, we've got a chance to see a couple of sessions uh, while we were uh, waiting for our chance. And a uh, couple of things that came out quite evident is uh, DevOps. I believe the definition is still not very clear. And trust me, uh, wow, the slides are bright. Um, the, the definition, it's, it's, it's a definition that's kind of evolving over a period of time. The way we see, uh, or rather the way uh, at least we are here to talk about uh, DevOps is how, uh, how traditionally, if you think about your dev teams um, over a period of time or tra traditionally DevOps or development team has been restricted to just what the dev team does. Uh, what we, as from Microsoft, are trying to do is kind of expanding that uh, scope, so to speak, to involve other stakeholders. When I say other stakeholders, it involves uh, getting your customers and um, customers and other business stakeholders into your development scenario, so to speak, as well as extending it beyond your development teams to IT, to your IT op operations, which is your production servers and you know, monitoring your applications in that environment. So basically, what we are trying to do is kind of expanding the scope from to go beyond um, just the dev, just the dev team. Uh, if you think about how, um, so predominantly that's what we'd like to cover today of how DevOps, DevOps plays throughout the life cycle of the application life cycle management, as well as how Microsoft is, uh, you know, uh, bringing our, or rather what we have to offer in the DevOps space. And obviously with the cloud infrastructure and the cloud offerings growing over a period of time, how you can actually leverage that also. Um, so if, if you think about how things uh, in today, I wouldn't say today's world, but maybe in the last couple of years, how typically we come across problems is either the customer reports a problem or there are problems which you never, never, never are aware of. Am I too loud? I tend to do that. No? Is it okay? We good? All right. Um, so typically how um, issues used to be reported is either the customer actually uh, reports a problem to you through a feedback mechanism or in many times reports, I mean, the, you never even get to know that there was a problem because you just lose a customer or if it's like a, let's say it's a, it's a e-commerce site and somebody faced a problem, there are times you actually don't even get to know of it because there is no feedback mechanism actually involved or implemented in the system. And, uh, okay, how many of you know what the device is? I see very young faces here, but you know, but this is used to be called a pager before the you know before the mobile phone came in. Um, so this is typically how uh, people used to get get uh, reports that something is wrong on the server. And of course, I know Anand has spent quite a lot of uh, nights out trying to sort that out. And when we actually get to a problem, the first thing, and I'm 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 quite sure you must have come across the situation. Okay. Um, Whenever a customer reports a problem and you go to the dev guy saying that the customer has reported so and so problem, the first response you get is that it works fine on my machine. Right? It happens all the time. The reason is because your dev environment is always configured for the best case scenario. Production servers are never configured for that. Production servers always assume worst case scenario. They shut down all the ports. I don't know, in SQL, you want to do, you know, you want to connect to the SQL server, SA blank password. Easiest thing. Why? For dev, you need to get things done faster. In production, it's always shut down. You have the, it's only open what is required. And typically, when we come to meetings of reporting issues, this is what typically happens. The infrastructure guy comes and says, everything is fine on my end. There's something wrong with your code. The dev guy says, no. Everything's fine with my code. There's something wrong in your, in, your, in your infrastructure. This is typically what happens today. I don't see in all cases, but typically what happens today. So if you think about what Dev DevOps is all about, it involves three pr primary elements. One is people. People are an important aspect of the DevOps cycle. Unless you, all of us, when I say us, I mean all of us, unless we, we are conscious or consciously participate in, 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 in thinking that we need to take care of not, okay, that's it, got it. 
All right. So we need to participate in ensuring uh, uh, a, a well-running production site. DevOps has to be part of your thinking process. It's not enough where you think that, okay, my dev environment works fine, my code works absolutely fine on my, on my dev server, everything's good. It has to be beyond that. Similarly, for the people in the operation side, they have to start getting involved in the, dev in the development cycle much earlier in the, in, the, in, the, in the game. We'll talk about that in a little more. And obviously, the process. You can have people who want to do good, but if you don't have any kind of stringent process in place, it's not going to help. When I say process, it's not, it's not about tools. It's about how do you do a release? How do you actually in incorporate feedback into your, into your applications? This is, there is, the process is separate, and of course, you have tools to enable the process. But get the process right first. And obviously, you need the tools that actually get to, uh, get to, uh, get to, help, to help you the process. Quick question here. Wild guess, right? What do you think is the biggest uh, aspect for failures in production? Take a wild guess. Is it people, process, or tools? Tools. People? People, okay. Okay, the, okay. let me put this. Stack rank them. People, process, or tools? What would be the mix? Do you think the, it's the products that fail? Is it the processes that are faulty? Or is it, is it people mistake that cause most of the failure? Process? Process? Okay, so here what I have is a, is a Gartner report. This is not us, Microsoft saying, this is a Gartner report which says 80% of the failures that happen is because of either application failure or an operation failure. It is because of operations. It's because of people and the process part and not the tools. You often tend to blame the hardware, you blame the code, blame software. That only accounts to 20% of the failures. And this is not us saying. This, this is study done independently by Gartner says it could be a wrong change management process. It could be a wrong overloaded um, person sitting and not overlooking a process. Or it could be a weak problem detection in your process chain. Simple things like, you know, if, if a, call it a bug fix or a, or a change management change request came in, a kind of QA process that you had implemented to ensure that that fix is not, you know, affecting something else, those are the things that actually causes, uh, causes applications to fail. It's not typically never the hardware and the OS. So how do you, how do you, how do you fix that? How do you try and address some of these challenges? How do I fix, obviously you have the right set of tools, you have uh, tools and products which can fix it, but how do you fix the, uh, the process and people part of it? Now, at least from an operation standpoint, the, some of the challenges, some of the things that we're trying to fix is one, obviously help dev accelerate the delivery process. Optimize the resources which are available, that's obviously something which is, which is IT or ops um, uh, mandate. Do more with less, right? Whatever you have, um, do uh, in, improve the availability. Again, availability is not something which the dev will much focus on. He'll say, I develop the code, it's up to you to deploy and make sure that it is available. And finally, increase application quality. Though there is, there is good, amount of, uh, good amount of dev as well as uh, um, ops, uh, mix which is needed for increasing the application quality, it's, it's more responsibility for, uh, it's, it's equally, both of us are equally responsible. But the idea here being, operations have to be there, involved earlier in the picture. When you get the infrastructure guys in earlier in the planning process, DevOps, the entire DevOps cycle, are, you are better off in getting a quality product than getting them involved later stage, right? So that's the that's whole idea of getting... Uh, in, in fact, if you think about uh, when you guys, and obviously you guys are you know, building world-class software, we don't, we, typically, again, we don't think uh, production. We never think about what is this application going to be, what environment will this application be running in? Mostly we focus on the business scenarios, not really the deployment scenarios. Fair, fair assumption? Yeah, yeah. So see, th these are things which we need to change. Uh, these are things which we can actually help us reduce failure in production. Now, this is again uh, another report that is actually presented saying that what are the kind of different initiatives and tools that support, uh, that support uh, a good DevOps initiative is version control system. Obviously, safe to assume that a lot of us are using some kind of a version control system or something. This is all to in ensure that there are lesser failures in, obviously, you know, change source history, change history, all that is taken care of. 
these are the bunch of, again, so again, a public available report, but the kind of uh, tools that are actually available to ensure a good DevOps initiative, as well as a bunch of uh, benefits that has been yielded by implementing these kind of uh, initiatives. This is, again, just to give you a quick, uh, obviously, it's publicly available. Um, this is another comment uh, which you think that, how many of you are actually thinking this? Nobody? Nobody? Well, <laughs> but trust me, it works. All right. Uh, it's a, it's a, like I said. It's a matter of the changing the way you where we should be approaching when you reach a solution when you're trying to sol uh, build a solution. Change the way you think a bit, and trust me, it'll give you a, a bunch of uh, benefits later on. So to quickly talk about how we bring um, the development team and the operations team together to work uh, to work well, Microsoft ALM uh, offering is primarily, I would say. The four, four different buckets. There's something called the planning phase, which is basically gathering your requirements, prototyping, uh, scheduling, excuse me, so on and so forth. Dev and test, obviously, is dev and test. Uh, releases, of, uh, release, uh, release management mechanism where you can actually set up a, set up a complete uh, workflow of how you want to uh, promote your code from one stage to the other, be it from dev to test to UA if you have any, or maybe from staging and then again to production. Basically a complete release management portfolio of release management cycle. And finally is when you actually release it to the production where we, the operation team takes over and starts monitoring your application and then gives, continuously keeps giving feedback to the dev team as and when things go wrong so that it becomes a cycle. It's, it's, Every application evolves. Every code that you've written today, at some point you're going to go, go and write that again, or rewrite it, or refactor it, or something of that sort, because you're constantly learning. Why? Because for whatever reasons. It could be because you're trying to make it better, or this, the business scenario has changed, or anything of that sort. Now, with, uh, from Microsoft, from the ALM stack, what we, what we have done is we've actually provided one single solution, or one single product that pretty much covers the entire uh, ALM offering, so to speak. So right from capturing requirements to uh, source code, uh, to source code, ha, source code control, okay, to source code control, to agile planning, uh, to test case management, to requirements capturing, uh, integration. And the good thing is, because this is one single product that gives you everything, it's the, I would say, traceability is intrinsic. So let me give you an example. If I have a requirement saying that I need to do create a login page, and I write a bunch of test cases saying that, uh, you know, test the login page, and I have a bunch of test cases, I can link this test case to this requirement. Every time a bug is reported, I report a bug against a, against a test case, which is again linked to this particular requirement. Automatically, you get complete end-to-end -end traceability. And obviously, you have the code that is written against that particular requirement. So because we are one single stack that offers everything end-to-end, -end, uh, traceability is uh, available right out of the box. Uh, obviously, we kind of integrate with other offerings, uh, other servers, be it project server if you want full-fledged uh, uh, full project planning. I hate to ask this question. I know this might be inappropriate, but how many of you are .NET developers here? I pretty much assumed. How many of you are surprised to see Microsoft here? Okay. <laughs> so fair question, right? Fair question. All right. <laughs> Okay, um, so yeah, let's, I'll keep this short. Uh, so we have a we have a, a ALM stack offering on on premise, which is which you can install on your box, physical box. We have the same thing available in the cloud, which we call Visual Studio Online. Uh, for those of you for the uninitiated, Visual Studio is our development stack, which is used to build uh, uh, .NET applications and so on and so forth. But one point I would definitely like to make: Team Foundation Server is platform agnostic, so you could be using. An Eclipse on a Mac, writing Java code using Maven or Ant as your build engine, and it'll just work well with Team Foundation Server because we integrate with all of these really well. Uh, so, you want to give it a sh uh, you know a run, please? I would encourage you to do that. Uh, so that's about the ALM stack. So we provide everything uh, right from end to end, right out of the box on one single uh, one single box. Uh, we can just go to the next slide. So if you think about what are the various uh, Comp components for, you know, like a source control for build, what do we have, what do we have for test case management, what do we have for deploy, and so on and so forth. So these are typically our offerings in each of these buckets uh, of, of ALM. Like for test, we have uh, a complete SKU, which is fundamentally used for test case management and uh, text, uh, test execution. And once we give it to this, uh, the operation side, system center takes over. Right. So what I see on the right-hand side is what we use for the, develop, uh, for the deploy and upside. And 
irrespective of what you use on the left-hand side, uh, be, it, uh, be it Visual Studio or Eclipse or Java or uh, Windows Server as a platform, Linux Server, be it on-premise, be it Amazon, be it OpenStack, what we can do is we can deploy and monitor, um, monitor your stack like no one else's business. So what are some of the things which we keep in mind when you, when you go through the entire DevOps process from Microsoft? So a couple of things like, when does the application ex exact development start? So when do you actually start the deployment? Does it, uh, is it, where is this app going to live eventually? Is it going to, in each phase, change environments? Because accordingly, we need to plan. I mean, these are questions that we would ask more from the ops side of things when you do the planning. And that's exactly why we say it is very, ne very important for you to get into the process, the ops team to get into the process early on in the development, uh, development cycle. So Other this, questions? Up. Yeah. So this is areas where you would want those, uh, where you want, you would, forcing you to think about production environments, like sensitive information. Uh, is, are you going to keep, uh, is everything going to be secure uh, communication? What kind of ports do you want to open, uh, open on the server? These kind of conversations is important to have upfront uh, in, in the cycles, rather than having this conversation when you're, once, you, once you're ready and good to go, because by then you probably are too late. What kind of SLA? What kind of performance are you looking at? Is it an app uh, which you're looking for targeting for 5,000 users, 50,000 users? I mean, as a developer, you may think, does it really ma matter? I mean, do I need to plan for that? But these are kind of questions that we need from an ops side of things, because is your go code going to scale, or is it, is it something that you're leaving up to my infrastructure to take care of it, right? If I need to do that planning, um, I need to uh, get that involved. So the bottom line being, um, start to be involved, get to be involved, get the ops team early on in the development uh, life cycle. See, one additional point on that, on that uh, the scalability thing. You might be building an application that has a tendency or that has a, a nature that it gets spikes of uh, usage, like for whatever reason. Let's say it's, a, it's, a, it's going to keep, go, keep going up every weekend. That's an important information you need to, need to be, you need to be telling the, the ops guy because he knows that he needs to schedule his infra in such a way that every weekend he spikes up a bunch of additional VMs and then brings down the scale once, once a weekend is over. This, how small that information might be, very important for the, for the infra guy to know because he knows that when he deploys his infra, he, he schedules the VMs getting fired up every, you know, every weekend or every Friday night. So in the planning phase, that's, that's, what, we, uh, that's what we gather from the dev teams. What happens in the develop phase? Once you start developing, then, uh, then you may start looking at um, creating the dev test environment in the first place, uh, looking at uh, infrastructure as a code, um, looking at uh, the client images, building the client images and giving it out, uh, handing it out to the dev teams. Not just one, but multiple environments, depending on you're doing a test uh, separately, build separately, dev environment separately. See, with the, with the power of the cloud today, you have the complete flex flexibility of setting up your entire dev environment on the cloud. And Everybody could just get along with a bunch of, I use the word dumb machines, but very hard to find, the, find those kind of machines these days. But even then, you could use just dumb terminals and you could actually have a complete dev environment set up in the cloud. And these are something which at least we are seeing very, very, I don't know if you guys do this very uh, often, but something which is very popular in the kind of people, uh, the kind of companies that we're working with, a lot of the people are just pushing their entire dev and test environment to the cloud because they've got zero infra on, uh, on, on, on site, but everything is on the cloud. At the same time, taking, uh, taking in mind, keeping in mind the backend connectivity stuff like VPN. How do I make sure that my on-premise teams are able to seamlessly work on the cloud just the way they did it on-prem, right? Things like VPN. How do I do a site-to-site -side VPN if it is a bunch of developers who are working on the same set of code or if it is an individual developer, how do I make an individual connectivity from his or her machine back to the cloud? Advanced infrastructure consideration, things like uh, how do I have a service gateway, how do I have a traffic manager, something which will do load balancing or redirecting traffic which is coming from a particular geography to a particular uh, backend infrastructure. These are stuff which you can deliver out of the cloud. Now, when you talk about uh, cloud, let me, let me quickly um, show you uh, how, how Windows Azure, Microsoft Azure looks like Quick question when it here. comes to. Sorry, how many of you have heard of Windows Azure? Please raise hands. Thank you. Uh, how many of you actually have an Azure account? Wonderful. Okay. Perfect. So this is a new management portal for Microsoft Azure. So as you can see, when you open up uh, the portal on your gallery, you have a bunch of uh, bunch of. Let me you zoom it so that. So I, I do see in my gallery there are uh, there are bunch of resources. I can go ahead and create a virtual machine, but then I can also go ahead and create a website if I don't want a full-fledged uh, virtual machine to uh, host your 
uh, database as well as uh, as well as your IS or Apache, you can just say uh, fire up a web server for me. Now, what kind of web server? Uh, I can I can go ahead and say uh, fire up a combination of web server which is um, which is just um, a particular combination like um, uh, Apache plus uh, MySQL. So I can I can do that. Let's refresh the page. Yeah. Right. So that's that's the first thing. Now, specifically around virtual machines, when I go ahead and create uh, a virtual machine, I can open up a gallery which tells me what, what is it that you're planning to host. Again, if I zoom in, you get to see that there are not only Windows servers, not only applications from Microsoft, but also open source, things like Ubuntu, things like CentOS, SUSE, Oracle, Puppet Labs, which means that there are pre-built images, and if these are not sufficient, we do have a VM depot, which is like an open source community, like a CodeBlex community, where the community maintains a bunch of images and you can go and pick and choose uh, from those. Or you can go ahead and upload your own images so that I have a corporate IT image of uh, my environment that needs to be uploaded so that when somebody asks for a uh, test in dev environment, I can go ahead and fire before without doing uh, much of job, I can do that as well. So let me quickly walk you through just two, three steps on showing you how easy is it to create a virtual machine from scratch. So I'm going to create a virtual machine for rootconf. Uh, so that all of you users can log in, root conf. I'm going to give a strong password for that. Now, here is how I, as a developer, go ahead and create an individual virtual machine from scratch. So I go and uh, enter in a bunch of details, uh, ask what are the endpoints that needs to be open, which means that if you're hosting a website, I want to probably have uh, HTTP port open. So those those are the kind of uh, kind of things which you would mention on on this uh, on this wizard, and finally uh, you would go ahead and tell what what is it that you want to you want to go and uh, deploy a plain vanilla virtual machine or do you want to go ahead and integrate with a backend uh, backend chef or a puppet server, right? So I can go ahead and say uh, I do have built-in extensions for chef puppet or you can write your own custom script so that uh, let's say I want to uh, connect to a backend chef, um, or I can um, uh, take it from a local repository, and I can go ahead and fire uh, that VM. So, in essence, what I want to show you is how easy or how uh, straightforward using a wizard is for is it is it for you to create a virtual machine from scratch or create a resource on the cloud from scratch. You can obviously do that with a code of your choice. I mean, you can go ahead and write a script. You can go ahead and do it in PowerShell. You can uh, fire the same thing from uh, like uh, Nah has mentioned, on a Mac and go and fire that uh, as well. But uh, that was a quick demo of how you do it, uh, do it, do it in the dev. And uh, recently, in addition to uh, allowing to provision Windows Server environments, we also now allow you to provision Windows Client environments. Like you could set up a Windows 7 and Windows 8.1. Win yeah, Windows 8.1 and Windows 7. We allow you to set up client machines uh, on the on on the cloud, and so. If you think about it, I could uh, be traveling and I can actually set up a VM anywhere in the world, uh, from anywhere in the world, I, should, I will be able to continue with my dev because my entire source code and everything is maintained in the, uh, in the cloud. So this gives you the, uh, it's a complete IAS play here. So in be it dev machines, you can set up a dev server, your configuration server, and all that from completely from an IAS perspective. Uh, the other option, like, like I mentioned a little earlier, is uh, you had Team Foundation Server on-prem as well as you have something called the Visual Studio Online, which is basically your ALM offering on the cloud. So you could actually have your dev machines sitting in Azure on a, with, in, in the form of VMs, connecting to a, a Team Foundation service, which is basically your ALM service in the cloud. Uh, so that is also another option that you can, uh, you can actually explore. Uh, release management, as, as you all know, uh, it's it's about how you the process is important. It's how you actually promote uh, your build from your dev to your other stages or other other phases of your uh, of your development. And it could be about uh, and and typically what the phases uh, what you would typically again this is not what uh, everybody should be following. But in your in a in a sample environment something like this where you promote your stuff from your dev to your test and you always should have an approver at every stage to ensure that somebody is actually certifying that this, this uh, you know, so, uh, so this, this build is good to go. So there are two parts to it. There is a process saying that uh, every build should be authorized by somebody. And there are tools to do that. So we have a tool from our, uh, from our side also, it's called InRelease, which is a company which we recently acquired. And we have actually incorporated InRelease as, as our release management offering along with uh, Team Foundation Server. 
and uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, in the in the in the operation phase, which is finally uh, where you give give back everything to the uh, to the IT guy, that's where uh, that's where Anand would come in. So, which means that once they handed all the code and you're good to go for production, you go ahead and deploy your code in production. That's where the ops team's majority of the work starts. That's where I'm constantly required to monitor the health of the application, not just from a standpoint of looking at CPU memory disk utilization, which are given, uh, having something like uh, NAGEOs in place and look at the vital statistics of the server. But then it would be more important for the business to see, uh, to give them intelligent reports, something that tells back business, saying that with a given kind of infrastructure, this is all that you can handle. Can you do like 5,000 concurrent users? Can you do 50,000? Unless you give that kind of intelligence back as a report or some mechanism back to business, those, uh, those reports are really not very meaningful. That's, that's what we mean when, when you say do a monitor in the, in the development or deployment phase. The second thing which, would, which, would, which I'd be concerned about as an ops guy is the scale. What if business comes back and says, I know, that this was actually built for 5,000 users, but then this is holiday season. I want to, I want you now to take this app and scale it out for 10,000 users. Now, do I go back to the developer and ask him, is your code ready for 10,000 users? He may say yes, then it is again my headache to make sure that how do I, how do I scale? I'll always say yes. You'll always <laughs> say yes, I know. And finally, it's, uh, it's about security. How do I secure the entire thing end to end, right from the core platform to the code, to auditing and logging so that if in case something happens. And I don't stop there. I need to constantly pass back the learning to the dev team so that we can have a very healthy cycle. So that in the next sprint of their release, they have a better, better uh, improvement in terms of scalability, in terms of security, in terms of deployment. Unless I give this intelligence back to the dev teams, they would have no clue. That's where it is in the entire DevOps cycle, at least the mics are working, right? No. No? Okay, it's not, okay it is, it is, it is. Yeah. So, in, it's gonna in the... It's going to take a bit. Yeah. yeah. So, that's yeah. where you pass on the learnings back, uh, and in the entire development uh, life cycle, um, it becomes very critical for the dev teams to get these kind of insights. So, so what uh, we can do is, in the interest of time, we can take any questions that you have, because I have a small demo where I can show you this entire uh, process, and then we are, we are good yeah. to go. So, till the slide comes up, or rather the projector comes up, we are happy to take any questions, other than stuff like, what are you guys doing here? So, does this make sense? No? At all? Not at all? Okay. I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, uh, when you say images as in virtual images? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, you don't have as many, I mean, to choose from. Is okay. There, is there a reason behind that? We're getting there. That's uh, right. So, this is something which we, infrastructure service from Microsoft Azure is something which we released in the, Ju in the month of July of 2013, right? So, it's, it's uh, less than a year now. It's not that we've been here for like 10 years and... A uh, lot of images that you see are, are, are recent additions, things like Oracle Linux, things like our tie-up with um, CentOS and SUSE are all additions which we made in the recent past. In fact, the Puppet and Chef integration happened Only in the build, build right? Time frame. In the build two, time frame. two months back. That's right. Uh, so, it's, it's, we, we, we are catching up. Uh, wrong word. No. Uh, we're getting there. Again, one of the things you'll have to keep in mind is what does it mean that uh, if I don't see an image there, what does it mean? Does it mean that it doesn't run or it is not supported? So the difference between an image being there and an image not being there is that an image that is there is fully tested and certified by Microsoft, unlike, um, unlike someone else who says that, yeah, it runs. So you can bring in your image, it may run, but don't call us for support. That's the only difference. You can bring in whatever you want as long as it runs on x64, as a platform, it, it, it should work upon the cloud. The only difference being, we are not tested it. So it's, it's, it's like we have a buffet, so you can pick from the buffet, you can bring your own food. Outside food is Similar allowed. Similar analogy. Outside food okay. is allowed. Yeah, outside food is allowed. More when compared with other providers. No. So if you check the prices recently, if you check the prices recently, we are more competitive. No, but, but, but when I 
when i we when we quoted for one of the automation uh, thing azure was three times a higher than what amazon was giving unless you are done very wrong calculation that can never be <laughs> that can never be the case and we trust me not. this this battle will not end any time now no, this will continue to happen you, i mean that's that's how that's how this business is so because i mean the price of a i mean like a tiny instance or a medium instance of ubuntu is totally different with the price of what uh, with amazon is giving with azure we would love to have the discussion we will have that later let's stick sure. to yeah go ahead technology i'll i i i know um, for sure that the prices are comparative as 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 any competitor out there in the market that's, that's our foundation um, because we are um, um, we are the late runners late entrants in the market we cannot afford to be at least in this um, this platform to be costlier right Okay, very quickly when you look at the ops, this is this is an example of a dashboard that we have from an ops side, right? So Jassy dashboard, some meters running, green, red. Now this green dashboard here tells me how is my my app performing. Now that is critical. That is different from the kind of dashboards that you see. Dashboard that you would probably see from an IT standpoint are these blinking lights which say disk uh, utilization, memory utilization. This is different. This is what I call as a as SLA dashboard, service level agreement dashboard. Directly impacts your business. If this is directly something which you can take to your business and say, "Give me more money," because with what you've given me, this is all that I can run. This, for example, is telling me that I'm giving back business a target of 90% uptime of my infrastructure since I'm running on-prem and I'm a lean team. But I'm uh, I'm on the contrary maintaining a, a SLA of 98%. However, there is another aspect that I'm measuring uh, my data center of, which is what is the target time that it takes for your shopping cart to load for example so here this dashboard is telling me that the target time was 50 seconds versus currently it is it is taking 97 seconds for you to load now here is where the traditional um, traditional fight starts or the finger pointing starts that's probably because the code is wrong that's probably because the networking guy did not do his job properly that's probably because the uh, san cannot take that kind of that kind of iops now there is where you need to look at a monitoring tool which can go beyond just telling you what are what are the vital statistics so for example this in this case i'm able to look at look at the uh, look at an incident and break down that incident into pieces Here in this case i have a dotnet code but it doesn't matter if i if i have a java code as well i can tell you did it have a stack overflow which line in the code gave you that pr particular problem in this case i'm telling there's a wcf code that ran that pulled up a, a sql query and is giving you a breakdown of each component by component uh, each query by query how long did it take so that i can try and figure out is this database probably not indexed properly not partitioned properly i need to do something at the database level versus uh, a wcf call or i can do some uh, something like this which tells me um, where did again is it is it because of the browser is it because of the ajax call that is being made is it because of the image is it because so i set myself a threshold of 500 milliseconds and look at what is the current uh, utilization so these are examples of how a proper monitoring system uh, if once deployed can deliver value not only to the ops guys but also to the dev guys how because i clearly know that there looks like an uh, there looks like a client performance exception happening which needs uh, which is relevant which is related to a client ajax call that the developer has built definitely not an infrastructure problem so what i can do is i can set the resolution state uh, as assigned to engineering and what then happens is all the data that I, i was looking into my dashboard those valuable information goes back to the developer so that he can start now building uh, or re looking at the code and try and fix the problem so this is where i mentioned earlier about how you're actually extending uh, development just beyond the development team and bringing the it uh, it guy inside if you remember i mentioned that we have something called our alm stack which is team foundation server so once let's assume that we went through the build and we went through our qa checks and we went through the release management and we finally deployed the application on the production server and it's and anand here is, has set some thresholds let's say for the sake of example that uh, the threshold one of the thresholds he said that is a page response time should be sub second let's say for the sake of example every time that threshold fails he gets an alert saying that it failed it failed at this point what anand can do like what you saw is that he can actually drill down to the, to those alerts figure out uh, what exactly went wrong there 
to the level as to what are the SQL statements that run, uh, run there. And by simple right click, you can say post to engineering. What happens now is because, I don't know if you mentioned, this is System Center, by the way, uh, which is our uh, product to monitor uh, data centers and so on and so forth. Uh, we have an integration. When I say we, Team Foundation Server has an integration with System Center. So what effectively will happen is when um, Anand says right click can say post it to engineering, uh, the system center actually posts a work item in Team Foundation Server along with all the information that he needs, including what is the OS that's running on it, what's the service pack that's running on it, um, all that stuff, which you typically are the questions you ask the guy when you when a bug is reported. What is the environment you're running in? Uh, what is what are the what are the what are the search query that you uh, what is the uh, product that you are searching for? These are the kind of typical questions you ask whenever a, uh, whenever a bug is reported. In this case, all that information is handed over to you in a platter, right from uh, and real world uh, real world real data as to right from the production server all the way back to your uh, to your development server, which is which is your ALM server, which is a uh, team foundation server. So this is our, uh, our, our interpretation of what a DevOps should be, wherein you're actually bridging the gap between the, the development team and the IT team, which is by you know, kind of continuously uh, uh, delivering value to, uh, to, uh, to the team. If you think about it, whenever a bug, for those of you who have fixed bugs in your life, um, fixing the bug is never the, uh, the largest amount of time. The, the, you spend the maximum amount of time trying to figure out where the bug is or why the bug is happening. Fix is typically not that not, not that much of a problem. The moment you find that this is a reason, it's a much easier it's a much easier conversation. The the objective here is to to, to reduce that. The moment you know that this is a scenario that uh, this is the environment that the uh, application was running in, this is the SQL query that it ran, and this is the reason why it you know it was showing 1700 milliseconds of runtime. That's that's gives you a focused area to go back and you know try and fix the bug. So this is uh, DevOps for us. So with your, you are you are continuously improving the application, which means uh, with the kind of SLAs, what I'm able to achieve is uh, is better control on MTTD, the mean time uh, taken for recovery, mean time between failures, mean time to failures, and a continuous delivery mechanism. Right? I now have the kind of insights uh, where I I am not in a situation where I'm pointing fingers. Is it a code issue? Is it a network issue? With the right kind of tools, what I'm able to deliver is to try and pinpoint, if not to find the root cause, try and pinpoint where the problem is headed. Is it a storage problem? Is it a code problem? Is it a network problem? Is it uh, something related to infrastructure? Is it related to cloud? And effectively, what, what um, we can deliver is better value to business. Right. So that's pretty much what we had uh, for our little talk today. What uh, we can now do is open it up to questions. So I see you have a question. Um, during your one of your slides, you mentioned about increased application quality, okay. and uh, I, there was a role that operations played, right? right? And then the series of stages for an application go into dev and a test and a stage and a live. Right. Unfortunately, between the time it goes into stage and live, there are like two days, three days. You know, where exactly are you talking about applying this increased application quality and ops involvement? So because stage is the full bo full blown environment. Okay, right? quality is never an afterthought. Yeah. Quality is always right from the design, dev, everything. When you see the quality is is typically it's like once let's do all the dev and then let's get into test. That is no longer, especially when if you guys are following agile and stuff, you go hand in hand, right? Uh, quality is always in there in every phase. So if you ask me where is where exactly are you suggesting we use quality? It is it's it's a it's a it's a horizontal. It's got to be through and through through every single phase. And you mentioned. Uh, Staging to production is a two-day... So pre-prod, right? Unfortunately, in most of the cases, we try to go early on stage, but by the time the cycles are done and you go into pre-prod, it's more around, oh, let's have a full-blown data test and then with the load balancers in the picture and active-active structure or whatever it is, uh -huh. and oh, that's the small test that needs to be run and then you go live, right? right. There had been a lot of instances where we have caught problems in stage and it's like, completely a DBA sitting there the whole day mm -hmm. trying to get a SQL optimized, right? So I understand the quality needs to happen all the way and the hand in hand is something that we talk a lot about, right? But I was wondering if there's something specific yeah. that an ops person is yeah. doing so more to from an ops, that. Like ops standpoint, mission. yeah, that's yeah. right. So if I have my plugin uh, from an ops standpoint in each of those uh, cycles in your development life, life cycle, I can take those inputs mm -hmm. and not just keep it with me, but give it back to the dev team. 
some examples. So uh, I'm in a dev stage. Mm -hmm. Before moving to pre-prod, one of the challenges that you mentioned was scale, right? How do yeah. I do? How do I do scale testing in pre-prod and make sure that stuff runs properly? Um, I can do a, a, a mini scale testing in the dev cycle itself, right? And I don't want to overload the dev guy with with testing uh, roles or testing function that he need to. Anything on the infosys side, if I'm writing a line of code and if that code um, was written, not written properly as a result of which I know for sure when it reaches stress testing, it may fail, can be an obvious thing that an ops guy can take and uh, give it back as an info to the dev team. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the examples where dev, uh, the ops team can get involved in catching out some of the performance bottlenecks and can help in uh, help in constant improvement in the life cycle. And you also have that uh, swap thing, right? The, uh, the option where uh, you could have a production and you could set up uh, a staging environment. And uh, what and you could do is that you first deploy to staging and once everything is due, you just do a flip. Uh, and so the people who are coming from the outside world, they see absolutely no difference. So you can switch between a prod and pre-prod, a test and prod environments with a flip of switch. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, couple of questions regarding the offerings of Azure. Uh, these days, AWS has been very uh, proactive in offering new new services uh, like EMR, Redshift, right. ELB, etc. Et so, right. what kind of managed services does uh, Azure provide, and uh, what kind of security? Uh, if we compare with AWS, they are they are banking heavily on VPNs. Right. What kind of security aspects are there? So security um, comes at multiple angles. So VPN is definitely there. The VPN is one of the one of the um, mechanisms for security. But for us, security is there in each layer, be it the infrastructure layer, be it a pass. Because if you look at Azure, um, Azure as such as an offering, we started off as a pass player, right? We came into infrastructure as a service late. We started off a pass layer, which means that security is first and foremost when you look at a pass standpoint, because it is a totally shared kind of infrastructure, right? You run, you run a piece of code, it is running on not just an individual virtual machine probably, which is isolated for you, but it may be running as a website in, in, a, in an IA server, which may be sharing code with some other vendor. So for us, security was first and form, foremost in our platform built at each and every layer, be it the storage layer, be it the compute layer, be it the virtual machine layer, be it the networking layer. Then came an info service as a service and for us, it became easier because we built our foundation that way. Now, if you look at the platform innovation that we're looking at, I'm, I know where you're getting at. Uh, so, managed API is something which we announced just yesterday. this week, yesterday. Yeah, day, yeah. Before, day before. So, the, the, the kind of innovation that we're bringing on the cloud, we are bringing at a rate at which we, we've never seen before. And we're able to do that because it's not a product release, it's just released to the web, right? So, every month you'll see a lot of announcements that are happening, and that's how it has been happening over the last one year. And if you look at the last one year, every month, every single month, we had at least five to 10 announcements that we had to make improvements on our platform. And that's a constant thing that is happening. Unlike like an SP1 that we release on the on the, on the the on-prem part of things, right? We have eight and then 8.1 and we have a constant cycle. That is not the case in the cloud. Yeah. Any other? Yes, ma'am. Uh, two questions. Do you have an API? for all the UI things that you are doing? Or API is partial or REST. Okay. Yeah. And uh, do you have a trial uh, like account to try yes, this? Yes, absolutely, account? yeah. So it provides everything that a commercial... So um, do you have an MSDN account? Uh, sorry? Do you have an MSDN subscription? No, I MSDN? think the first question is, uh, yeah. do you have an no. MSDN account? You already have Azure. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. So I you can go to your MSDN subscription, activate your Azure. Okay. Every MSDN, so... For all of your MSDN subscribers in the room, okay. if you are not aware, you already own certain hours of Azure as part of your subscription, depending on what level of subscription you are at, okay. right? Platinum, Premium. I, yeah, I so uh, MSDN comes in three, uh, primarily three editions, Pro, pre, uh, Pro, Premium, and Ultimate. Okay. If you have uh, Ultimate, you get about $150 worth of compute hours on, uh, on, on Azure every, every month. So it gets reset every month. So from the time you activate, that's your day one. Then every 30 days, it just keeps resetting uh, back to zero, no, as, as, an, as you consume, and then it resets back to $150. So 
that is a great thing to leverage. And again, for those of you who have MSDN uh, uh, subscriptions, you also have uh, load testing capability available in uh, on Azure. On on Azure. So what you could actually do is that if you're using Visual Studio, you could actually run a load test on on Windows Azure. Okay. So it's about fifteen thousand. I forget the number, but yeah. It's but if you don't have an, uh, an MSDN subscription, you can always go ahead to and sign up for a free trial. So we give you 30 days free trial where you get $200 uh, worth of compute. So that's your first question. What is yours? Yes. So, uh, and is there a way to integrate it with other providers like OpenStack or CloudStack? Like uh, when you say integrate, what exactly? Like, uh, suppose I want to... Uh, Use OpenStack uh, frontend uh, API to APIs to fire uh, uh, environments on demand in uh, Azure Cloud. So that's what today the way you can do that is either use REST okay. APIs or PowerShell. PowerShell, I don't know how you'll integrate with a with an oh, OpenStack yeah. frontend, but yeah. REST yes for sure. You okay. can make REST calls to Windows Azure, and we do have in MSDN enough and more code snippets that you can copy and paste onto various different frontends. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes, sure. sir. Last question. So the monitoring tool that you mentioned was system server or something. System like center. That. System center. Uh, is there a open source version of that, a commodity version or something like that? Consum I mean, uh, open source version when you said free. Let's put it that. No, one second. Free version. Of Your question is: Do you have a commercial version of system center? Free version of system center. Oh, free version of system center. Is that what your question was? Correct. Right. So yes. Um, we do have a free version. Obviously, there's a difference between what is possible in the free version, what is not possible in the free version, right? So there is a free version, which is called the System Center Advisor. So if you can go to systemcenteradvisor.com, you can go ahead and sign up for free. You can point that to your Windows servers, Windows servers, and it will give you all of the statistics, like operational performance, all of that. But not the kind of dashboard that you saw. It'll give you built-in dashboards. You cannot obviously customize those dashboards. What can be monitored are minimal. But yes, we do have a free version as such. And I don't know if you missed it, but uh, like Anand mentioned, System Center is not to monitor just uh, Windows boxes. You could even monitor non-Windows boxes. So you know, Unix, you have, Linux, yeah, Unix, Linux, and stuff like that. You can monitor uh, those boxes. Right. And Java apps, non-Microsoft apps. Great. I think uh, in the interest of time and having dinner in time. Uh, Thank you so much for being so much. such a wonderful audience. I hope this was good.